In the early 1520s, Europe was in absolute chaos. An unsuspecting German monk had unwittingly recruited millions into his rebellion against the highest authority in the land, the Catholic Church. The lines were clear. You are either a Lutheran or you're a Catholic. But at the exact same time as Luther, someone else was also protesting against the church. Some say he even started beforehand. In today's Reformation episode, we lead Germany to travel southward to meet someone else who was making waves in Europe. You might not have ever heard of this guy. I mean, he certainly wouldn't rank in most people's top five Reformation figures, but he was so important in shaping the beliefs of Europeans who liked most of what Luther said, but certainly not everything. Today, we're going to meet Ulrich Zwingli. And because we're only giving him one episode, we're not going to cover his whole life. But I'll tell you this right now. Had he not died the way he did, we could have been making about four episodes on this guy. Let's get into it. Hello there. Okay, so we'll cut straight to the chase with Zwingli's life. Zwingli was a priest who lived in Switzerland during the early 1500s. Now, Switzerland was very different back then. In the 1400s, it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. So Germany and Switzerland used to be part of the same kingdom. And so in 1499, the Swiss canton split from Emperor Maximilian, and each canton got to control itself completely independently. Oh, now, the cantons agreed to form what we call a confederacy, and so they'd back each other up if one another went to war. But each canton of Switzerland had complete control over itself. So if you just zoned out then, rewind. The fact that each canton is independent is going to get really important later on. So Zwingli was what we call the people's priest in the Zurich canton. And so basically the Zurich priest was the most influential priest in the city. And so for the same reasons that we discussed in our first Luther episode, click here if you haven't seen it, Zwingli was horrified at the state of the Catholic Church. What he saw just didn't match up with the early church in the Bible, and so he began to call out the Catholic Church. Now, like Luther, Zwingli taught that the Bible, and not the Catholic leadership, was the highest authority in people's lives. Zwingli was also something of what we might call an iconoclast, someone who wants to destroy sacred objects. You see, an important part of Catholic practice was to pray to objects like a painting of Mary. Now, they didn't believe they were praying to the painting, but they believed that Mary was represented, say, in the painting itself. But Zwingli strongly rejected this because he believed it caused people to worship an object rather than God, and he called upon Zurich churches to stop worshipping these icons. Now, having no idea how persuasive he would be, in 1523, many citizens of Zurich took to the streets, broke into churches, and destroyed icons. So we call these people the iconoclasts. Another interesting point is that Zwingli believed that priests should be able to marry. You see, the Catholic Church even today still teaches that priests must be celibate because the duty of priesthood is so high that their attention shouldn't be split between that and having a wife. They believe that priests should be devoted purely to the priesthood. Now basically, because Zwingli believed that the Bible had the highest authority, and because the Bible talks about church officials having wives, he thought this was a rubbish rule. But nonetheless, Zwingli was also a bit of a naughty boy on this front. 300 years after Zwingli had lived and then died, a devoted follower of Zwingli flicked through a collection of his letters in the library and he found a letter where Zwingli confessed to a friend about secretly impregnating his mistress in 1519 before marrying someone else later on. Now, Catholic or Protestant, this was a scandal. The follower had no doubt it was Zwingli's writing, but this ruined his image of Zwingli being a hero that could do no wrong. So the follower actually held the letter to a candle and hoped to burn this bit of evidence. And with about a quarter of the letter still to burn, he changed his mind and pulled it out saying, no, Protestantism is truth in all circumstances. But Zwingli's affair was a secret to the Swiss public at the time. And as he joined Luther in criticizing the Catholic Church, his name began to be more recognized across Europe. And so in many ways, Zwingli and Luther were much the same. They both taught that the Catholic Church was wrong, they both taught that people get to heaven by faith in Jesus and not by their good works. They both taught that the Bible was the highest authority and they both taught that priests could get married. But there was one massive issue they disagreed on. The Lord's Supper. For those who don't know, right before Jesus died, he broke some bread, held it up and said, This is my body, take this in remembrance of me. And so Christians eat bread to remember the death of Jesus. Now, Zwingli and Luther had totally different views on this topic, and they met in 1529 at the Marburg Colloquy to see if they could work out their differences and join their churches together. Luther kept hammering the point that Jesus said, this is my body, and Luther believed that when priests blessed the bread, the bread literally became Jesus' body. On the other hand, Zwingli emphasized Jesus' line, 
do this in remembrance of me. And Zhongli argued that it was about remembering Jesus' death, and so the bread did not become Jesus' body. I know this seems like the stupidest nitpicky point to argue over, but their beliefs about Jesus' body had some pretty big ramifications. Luther believed that by Zwingli denying the bread was Jesus, Zwingli was denying Jesus himself, and so he was therefore not a Christian. Die, Zwingli believed that Luther was worshipping an object instead of worshipping Jesus, and so they couldn't resolve their differences at the Marburg Colloquy. It was a total failure. Europe was divided between Catholic, Lutheran, and now Zwinglian territories. Finally, we move on to Zwingli's death. Now, I said at the start that the Swiss cantons were really important. And so some cantons like Zwingli's were Zwinglian cantons, but some of the cantons were also Catholic cantons. And in one of these Catholic ones, Schwitz, a Zwinglian preacher was captured and then executed. Now, Zwingli was furious that one of his own would be treated like this, and he demanded that Zurich declare war on Schwitz. And the situation escalated really badly, and it nearly brought all the cantons into a terrible Swiss civil war. But thankfully, the cantons managed to sort out a peace before too much damage was done. And so the Catholic cantons were not allowed to ally with other empires like the Austrians, and then the Zwinglian cantons agreed that they wouldn't go to war with these Catholic ones. However, the rest of the terms of the peace were not that clear. You see, Zwingli thought that they'd agreed that Zwinglian preachers could preach anywhere in these cantons, whereas the Catholic cantons thought they were allowed to stop them from preaching. Catholic canton, Catholic rules. That's what the Catholics thought. Zwingli was furious at this and he called for war against the Catholic cantons. This time, the government gave him the war he wanted. And so on October the 11th, 1531, 2,000 soldiers from Zurich stood against 7,000 from the Catholic cantons. And to make up the numbers for the Protestant side, many pastors became soldiers, including Zwingli himself. Now, the story of Zwingli's death is likely somewhat wrapped in myth, but as the story goes, Zwingli went to help a soldier down on the ground when he himself was struck on the head by a flying rock. And so Zwingli went to feel his head, and as he felt the blood, Zwingli realized that he was a dead man waiting. And so he decided to sit under a tree, and as he sat under the tree, a Catholic army surrounded him. Now, they were trying to get him to surrender, but he was shaking his head, refusing, for the blood actually stopped him from being able to speak. And when the Catholic army realized that they were getting nowhere, a captain speared him in the throat, and then they went and burned his body afterwards. Like I said, probably wrapped a little bit in myth, but a crazy death story, right? And I'll finish with Luther's words when he found out about Zwingli's death. Luther said, It was a judgment of God. That was always a proud people. The others, the papists, will probably also be dealt with by our Lord God. Now, I think Luther calling Zwingli proud is an incredibly rich comment, but his death is fascinating. A decade earlier, Zwingli himself said that his priorities were in order, one, being a soldier of Christ, two, defending his country, and three, leading Zurich. Well, Zwingli was certainly a soldier of Zurich to the death, but the other two, uh, can't be really convinced. He fought against people who were A, Christian, and B, Swiss. I wonder if the younger Zwingli would have actually got on well with the older Zwingli. Stay tuned for our next episode where we look at more crazy wars, except next time, it's not trained soldiers, but peasants. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps this channel grow. And I thank you so much for watching Mr. Mitchell. And I can't wait to see you for our next episode into a fascinating part of history.